Hello, I'm Chuck Wolf, Chief Executive for Charles J. Wolf Associates, LLC. As a motivational speaker and a leadership consultant and executive coach and trainer, I often work with very successful people in their companies. Since many can't afford a professional, I volunteer to host a radio talk show called The Emotion Roadmap, Take the Wheel and Control How You Feel, on a nonprofit community radio station in Bridgeport, Connecticut, WPKN. My reason for doing the show is to share with as many people as possible this wonderful process for helping people manage their own emotions and their relationships with others. My goal is for everyone listening to learn to use the Emotion Roadmap to make life better. As you listen to me, help others, I hope you are also learning. As a Simsbury resident, I'm delighted to be able to make the show available through Simsbury TV. To learn more, go to my website, www.emotionroadmap.com. Thank you for listening and watching. Hi, I'm Chuck Wolf, and you're listening to the Emotion Roadmap. Take the whale and control how you feel. And today is November 4th when you'll be watching this, um, or you might be watching it later than November 4th, but not before. And this is the day after elections. And since I'm recording this on November 1, I don't know who won the election. But my focus today isn't really on who wins as much as how each of us wins in terms of our relationships with all those others who we say we love, who we say we like, who are our friends and our relatives who may not see things quite the same as we do. And it's really important, I think, hopefully you think, if you're listening to the show, that um, we find ways to get along with one another and we find ways to get past our differences. I'm struck by a number of things that have happened in the last four years since the last election. And it's been problematic, hasn't it, for many of us in terms of the relationships we have with people who we love, like, care about, who see things differently somehow than we do? How is that even possible? Sometimes Some of you are asking. I've asked that myself sometimes. It seems like there are a number of people on both sides of the aisle that um, I agree with some of what each of them has said about the different candidates and different parties, but not all of it. I tend to see things much more gray, it seems, than other people who see things quite black and white. So if you're black and white and you see it one way or the other, you'll like some of the things I say today and not others, right? <laughs> because I'm gonna try and find some kind of balance for those of you that want that balance. This shows the emotion roadmap. Take the wheel and control how you feel. Do you want to control how you feel? How are you feeling? I'm going to try to read from a number of articles that um, I've looked at today uh, in, re in recent days and then compiled today because I, I want to cover what I think is really useful information uh, from a variety of sources that I think are really good sources. Um, and I, I believe you probably agree that the sources have some legitimacy in terms of their uh, reputations, but you may not agree with everything they say. So I want to start with um, the National, Pu National Public Radio. Uh, there's an article that a friend of mine sent me. Supposedly it was written October 27th, but anyway, it says, dude, I'm done when politics tears families and friendships apart. Okay, <laughs> that's the title of the article. And I want to share just some of the comments of people that were interviewed for this article. Um, I don't know if you found yourself fighting with friends and family about different points of view that you may have. Um, and this is what was said. I did straight up say, dude, I'm done. Lose my number, said Sharmar Davis from Los Angeles, recalling when he unfriended a guy he'd been friends with since high school 25 years ago. I just hung up on my end and proceeded to block him in every possible way, said Joni Jensen from New York, still fuming over the guy she felt compelled to dump and betraying just a tinge of regret about cutting off his cousins, Ricardo DeForest of Tampa, Florida conceded, I hate to say it because family is everything, before unabashedly proclaiming, I disowned them. In my mind, they're not family anymore. Doesn't that concern all of you that are listening for people to feel that way about family and friends, boyfriends, high school friends, family members? I think it's just sad. I had a friend, family friend actually, 
both family and friend, I consider him, who said, after I sent him an email about something that he had posted on Facebook, which I thought was wrong, I didn't want to make a big deal out of it because I don't like to comment on Facebook about politics. I just don't think that's the right place. I mean, for me, Facebook is about family and friendship. And I love to publish beautiful things. I like to take pictures of walks in the forest, beautiful flowers, um, things that I grow, things that I see that just strike me as something worth sharing. So when people post items in Facebook about politics, mostly I ignore it. If something seems untrue to me, and there's facts that I know that seem to support that it's untrue, I'll send it along privately to the person. And I did that. And the response I got was, Chuck, I'm not going to unfriend you for this, but, but, <laughs> but I might. <laughs> so what is it about these politics that are so divisive, that are so polarizing? Why is it happening? <laughs> Here's another one. Davis, 42, a consultant who is black, he said he simply could not abide his friend downplaying police brutality and harping instead on the looting and violence happening amid the most peaceful protest. I told him, if this is your attitude, we can't be cool anymore, David said. I don't respect you now, I don't, because people are really dying. Jensen, the retired professor, also sees it as a moral absolute. As a sexual assault survivor, she said, she couldn't stand it when the guy she'd been close to for 40 years was being, cav was being cavalier about the allegations against President Trump's then Supreme Court nominee, Brett Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh vehemently denied the sexual assault allegations, but this is what she, uh, she said. She said, was going off like, oh, you drank the Kool-Aid and Kavanaugh didn't do anything, is what her friend had said. It made me sick. If this is his core ethics, I don't want that kind of person in my life. So that's one side of it, right? And then conservatives. Here's one from a fellow named DeForest. They sold our country out, DeForest, a 61-year-old steel worker, said of those on the left of the political spectrum. This election is about the soul of what America is. You can't be a free country and be a socialist state at the same time. He said the acrimony he's feeling comes from what he calls Hardcore Trump haters. Yeah, this was as much a factor in his decision to cut them off as the differences that gave rise to it. People would say to him, Trump is a racist, honor an orange man bad, orange man racist. They're throwing spittle and their veins are popping out of their heads, he said. But they, they assume I'm some sort of horrible racist because I like Trump. It's ridiculous, he said. A professor, a director of research at the Pew Research Center, Jocelyn Kiley, said political polarization is more intense now than any point in modern history. Nearly 80% of Americans now have just a few or no friends at all across the aisle, according to Pew, and the animosity goes both ways. So one of the things I've done recently is I participated in a Brave Angels um, workshop webinar. It was, uh, it's free, by the way, and if you have an interest in civil discourse and the ability to talk to one another without veins popping out of our heads or just seeing the worst in one another, Braver Angels is really a place you might want to seek out. Uh, I've only recently begun exploring how to work with them, and uh, I'm very impressed with what they do. Uh, they ask for and, and look for people who are from red states from blue states and consider themselves either Republican or Democrat or the color purple for those who are more mixed. And that's kind of where I see myself. Some of the policies that have happened the last four years, I'm very in support, I'm very much in support of. Other things I think are pretty nasty and awful. Um, but I think it's true that there are things I like about both sides and things I really dislike about both sides as well. So I'm not a party person anymore. I'm much more of a person who just tries to find somebody who wants to go into elected office as a statesman or as a stateswoman, someone who really wants to put country first, someone who believes in doing what's right, who's willing to accept an idea, whichever side of the aisle it comes from, and work to make it whole and work to make it right. And by the way, I don't need someone to agree with me. Who I want to support as an elected official. It's not about agree. I don't always agree with myself. 
It's more about just trying to listen, really listen to each other, to understand each other's points of view, to really look for what's the best in each of us as individuals. What are our best selves? And what do we think is the best idea or ideas for the country? What do we really believe is going to work, that's going to serve most of us in the best way possible? And if that particular idea conflicts with something our party is saying we need to support, I want that person to be able to stand up and say, I support it anyway. I support it because it's the right thing to do. And I'm not so worried about being reelected because there is enormous pressure on officials to be reelected to support their party, 100%. Because a lot of the money for elections comes from the party. And if you're not a party supporter, 100%, they're wondering if they want to support you or somebody that's a better fit maybe the next time in the next primary. So there's tremendous incentive for politicians not to collaborate, not to cooperate. There's another group I work with called No Labels that is a big advocate for creating more bipartisanship. They have worked hard and they have helped to establish what's called the Problem Solvers Caucus. And you probably have heard me talk about this before if you've listened to the show. And again, you're listening to WPKN 89.5 FM, listener supported radio in Connecticut, broadcasting out of Bridgeport, Connecticut. And it's listener supported. We get support from each of you. And I know that we have a very, very liberal base. And so I suspect many of you are those who really support the blues or the Democrats and, and tend to not really value or like what's happened in the last four years. And yet, I suspect if I asked you about certain policies, you'd probably say, well, I supported that one. I supported, you know, this whole idea of trying to get people fully employed. I really like that when that was happening. In fact, I benefited from it even. Um, or I'm really glad ISIS is gone, right? Or the veterans are no longer having to wait in lines and some of them even dying because they haven't been able to get into a veterans administration hospital. So I'm sure there's probably a few things that if I asked you specifically about some policies, you'd say, well, I like that one. <laughs> but man, <laughs> just like the fellow said, orange man bad, right? orange man racist, all these things that are out there. Um, it's, so it's hard, right? It's hard to know how to deal with this constructively. One of the things Braver Angels said that I thought was so interesting the other day when I was attending one of their webinars was that 70% of our country, all of us, that's seven out of every 10 of us, believe that if the wrong man gets elected, we're in deep, deep trouble. But that's on both sides. The people that support the president feel that way, just as the people that are anti-Trump feel that way. So what about what goes forward? What goes next? What comes on November 4th? Now, we may not know who's president on November 4th, and that's the day you're listening to this on the radio when you're listening live. So it might be some time before we really know who got elected, or who won the election anyway. And so as we go forward, this is another statistic I think is really important to understand. 70% of our entire country think that we have to do a better job with bipartisanship no matter who wins. So seven out of every 10 of us want the future to be better. And we may think the only chance of the future being better is if Joe Biden's president or if Donald Trump gets reelected. Because there are people, even who listen to this station, that probably support the president. But I'd like people to not allow who they support to stop them from being friends with people they've been friends with for years. Stop, to cut off family members. I mean, to me, family and friends are more important than my politics. My politics are important to me, I understand that, but my friends, my family, way more important to me, and I hope to you as well. Let me share some more from this article. Uh, <clears throat> this one says, Democrats are a little bit more likely to say they'd end a friendship, so Kylie said, but Republicans may be less likely to say they have friends on the other side. <laughs> so it may not all be that differential, I guess. A clinical professor said the rancors rising, she said, as both sides tend to view the other as being more extreme than they actually are necessarily. 
Another thing conservatives and liberals have in common is that they all suffer from big blind spots when it comes to the morality of their own side. Now, stop for a minute and just ask yourself. I mean, I get it about the other side, right? They have enormous blind spots. Me? No. I mean, I might have a small blind spot possibly, but no big ones, right? <laughs> Reconsider, just just possibly. Uh, take this point of view. I, it's really interesting. I, I was part of a conversation this morning, a dialogue with a number of people. And uh, it was a bunch of people that were very liberal. And they uh, they tend to see the blind spots on the other side, right? And you, you ever hear people say, you know, some of my best friends are black. Or some of my best friends are Jewish. Or some of my best friends are Muslim. Or whatever it is. And then they go on to say, but... <laughs> This is what I know, or what I've seen. And it's not usually a good story, right? Now, I think people are saying that, at least that's what I heard in this conversation this morning, was people are saying, you know, some of my best friends are conservatives, but, <laughs> and then go on to say all the horrible things, right? Uh, but I've heard conservatives do this too. Some of the best friends I have are liberal, but I just don't get it. How could they possibly, and then whatever, goes, goes forward past that. So, how do we do better going forward, right? So here's a thought, a little more listening to understand, a little less trying to convince. One of the people that work with me recently in, in some of the work I do on emotional intelligence, some of you know I'm an expert in this field of emotional intelligence. In the show, The Emotion Roadmap is all about my creation, about how to help you manage relationships more effectively, have more influence over, over others, but also to control your own emotions. So. That's a little bit about what today is about, right? So what I want you to think about is what she said, which I thought was so powerful. She said one of the things she learned as she was learning about the emotion roadmap is to challenge her own self-talk. When she finds that someone, this isn't necessarily just about politics, she said, but when she finds someone saying something that she really disagrees with, vehemently disagrees with, immediately she begins to think about what will I say when this person stops talking? How will I defend my position? How will I show this person the error of their ways, right? How can I do that? So one of the things that she does that's new to her, that she's learned since working with this emotion roadmap, is to stop herself and say, wait a minute. Stop the self-talk that's defending my position. And let me try and understand who this person is, who I respect, who I like, what their opinion really is and why they hold it so strongly. Why are they passionate in a way that makes very little sense to me? And I know the person in front of me is not a dumb person. It's somebody I really like, so I, I'm invested in, in making this work. Instead of challenging what they're saying, what if I just stop and try to understand why they're saying what they're saying and why it's different? One of the exercises I suggested to the facilitator of the discussion I was in this morning was simply to stop and ask people, take the other position just for a little bit if you can, and just say to yourself, if you're a liberal, if I was a conservative, if I supported the president, if I really desperately wanted to see him reelected for four years, what could I say? What could I say to make the case. Or if I'm a conservative, and I clearly think the liberals make no sense, and yet so many people are in that camp. How can they be there and then do the same thing? If I were a liberal, if I was wanting the Democrats to win, what would I say to a conservative? What, what would be my argument? I don't think this is easy, by the way, for either side to do this, for the other side. But I think instead of our trying to discuss with one another our polarized positions, which sometimes they feel very polarized, right? Instead of doing it that way, what if we, in our own minds, internally, raise some of these questions, raise some of these points, raise some of these arguments, and let that sit with us a little bit? Carl Rogers, many years ago, was a fa famous therapist. 
who created the Rogerian technique, which was to be reflective, to be an active listener, to be non-judgmental. What he basically taught, and it was a wonderful technique, is to just reflect what another person is saying. Reflect the feelings, the thoughts. Help them to really understand and summarize what's going on in somebody's own mind by, by really being an active listener who hears not just the words, but the tone and the emotion and can reflect all of that back to the person. He said, one of the dangers with this for the therapist is that you begin to identify with the person you're counseling. You begin to understand their point of view. You begin to feel what they're feeling. You begin to see what they're seeing. Think what they're thinking. Now, that might scare a lot of you to death <laughs> to, to think possibly that you might land up actually believing some of this stuff that you thought was heresy for so long. I encourage you to give it a shot, at least when it comes to people that are families and really close friends, that you don't give them up because of politics. Some people have found the need that and the necessity to kind of isolate politics and not talk about it at all. It's a choice you can make. I used to really like talking about politics. It was fun. It was fun to hear what you thought. Why do you think differently than I think? Really? Is that who you're voting for? You really, is that really? Why would, you, why would you vote for him or her instead of this other person? And as you're thinking about that, as you're listening to another person who you really respect and you really care about, Share why they're passionate about something and someone different than you. Can you identify with that at all? Can the love that you have for this other person overcome the differences you might feel about politics? That's what I'm hoping. That's what the show is targeted to do today. Mm -hmm. So, in this Sanfiar article, one of the thoughts I wanted to share was that um, one of the statements was we're flattening people out in terms of our view of them. And we're not really seeing the full complexity of people on either side. Now, it's hard. It's hard to do this. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, you can think of the worst things about people who are voting on the other side, I guess. Um, you, you know, this is a, a truck driver who's, who's gay brother. You know, this is what he said to him. He said, when he found out he was a Trump supporter, he said, he went off of me saying, essentially, I'm a racist and a homophobe just because I'm a Trump, Trump supporter. No ifs, ands, or buts. And he completely cut me out of his life. They haven't spoken in years, he said. Now, he's, he's determined not to do the same thing to his friends, including his best friends who supports former Vice President Joe Biden. But he said, he, he said I could assume that anybody that supports Biden is a firm believer that it's okay to murder a baby, he said. But I don't. Another conservative, Judith Margolis Freeman, may be one of the few who can claim she's managed not to lose any friends over politics. But she said that's because she keeps her views secret, because to share them would be political suicide. And then she decided more recently to just come out of the closet. That's how she feels about it, coming out of the closet. And she, and she just says, you know, people don't like my views and they don't want me as a friend. and They're not really friends anyway. So this is really hard, everybody. This is nothing easy about this. Uh, one of the things that, to lower the temperature and, and, and try not to continue toxic conversations, but you don't want to retreat into your own information bubble. Experts said more conversation, not less. That's needed um, if the nation is, is able to heal its blistering divide. But it has to be healthy, productive conversation. And a person who runs a workshop on civil discourse added that the first step must be to take it off social media and talk in person instead. So I encourage you to pick up the phone. I know people like to text some email, some post on social media, but if you really got something to say, maybe the best thing is just to pick up the phone. I actually find when I pick up the phone, things seem to get better quicker. They really do. Um, because you're hearing the other person right away that maybe there's an issue and you can address it without the assumption of what goes into a text or an email or some other kind of social media post. I wanna talk next about thinking through unforeseeable election fallout 
This is actually quoting a friend of mine at Harvard University, a woman named Judith McLaughlin. I had Judith on my show. Um, I can't remember exactly when, but it, it was within the last year talking about the president's program she runs at Harvard. She runs a program for all kinds of senior leaders from universities to come in and attend the president's program to talk about how do you get yourself ready to take over a university. So she was working with university leaders from around the nation and they shared some ideas from a town hall. I'd like to share a few of them with you. So here's a quote. This is an unprecedented election in terms of the intensity of emotion that surrounds it and in terms of the expected duration of the uncertainty that will follow the actual election day. This was by Judith McLaughlin. And Judith is a uh, lecturer who teaches courses on leadership and governance in higher education at the graduates, Harvard's Graduate School of Education. She said, we heard from people who are already experiencing stress on their campuses, from big truck rallies rolling through their campuses, the students who are expressing intense emotions and anxiety over the election. In a recent town hall, 140 university officials from around the US exchanged ideas about how to be better prepared for election day and its aftermath. The event was led by Judith and several others who co-teach crisis leadership in Harvard education. A discussion paper identified some of the, some of the ideas behind it. One of the ideas was, it's, well, first they said it was, it's really hard to get people to pay a lot of attention to those two crisis emergencies in advance because people take our courses as administrators who are used to dealing with known risk and figuring out what to do about them. And this, this is different. This is really different. One of the things that's made it different is COVID, right? Because no one knew how to deal with COVID. And we're still learning, right? No, we're not really sure how to deal with COVID. Um, I know we have people that say follow the science. Uh, that's clear. Um, and when, in the discussion I did have this morning that I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the people said, you know, the science that says we need a lockdown is a science that is um, in part a problem for a lot of people that really think that they can't afford to lock down because they're young families with children to feed and they feel like if I don't go to work and earn an income, I can't feed my kids. And while I'm frightened by COVID, legitimately frightened by COVID, I'm also scared to death that I can't feed my kids. And that actually takes precedence. And, and then the same person said that, and also we, there are people out there that have built a business, have spent their entire lives building their businesses. 20, 30, 40 years old, their businesses are, and they're losing them, and they're seeing them be lost. And the idea of more shutdowns, as much as it might make scientific sense on that end, is causing other scientific-related issues, like depression, opiate overdoses, um, there's um, a lot of more domestic violence, abuse in the families, um, all kinds of issues arising from people at home completely out of sorts and afraid to go back to lockdowns for fear of what might happen on, mul on, on multiple um, issues. So you want to say, hey, it's black and white. The science says such and such. Nobody's arguing that point. Although I guess even some scientists would disagree with that. But let's assume that the science, for the most part, we know what we're doing. And yet what we're doing is causing more harm. And, and uh, it was Voltaire that said, sometimes you have to worry that the cure is worse than the disease. I'm a French philosopher many years ago. For some people, that's the case here. I know that's hard to accept that. Why wouldn't everybody just do what seems right to do? Not everybody's in a position where they can step back and wait it out. Wish that they were. Right? So one of the things that they feel like they had to do in the Harvard article was that they had to have processes in place what's going to happen on campus the day after elections the month after elections if we still don't know what are we doing what pro and so they started to talk about how do we put processes how do we institutionalize systematize ways we're going to be able to talk to one another to relate to one another to keep any violence if violence does happen how do we respond what do we do to not over escalate but yet manage the conflict some people seem to think it was okay to allow buildings to burn. Other people thought, what? How can that possibly be okay? Right? So, I mean, again, nothing here seems to me at least to be black and white. 
There's so much gray out there. So much gray. That was the Harvard. One of the other articles I happen to want to pick up and talk to you about is How to Thrive When Everything Feels Terrible. <laughs> this was by Christine Porath and Mike Porath. They're talking about negativity every place we turn, right? There's COVID. There's, um, uh, there's the election right now. There's all kinds of economic news that isn't, isn't great. <laughs> we have cold weather coming. Uh, that's going to exacerbate the situation. We have hospitals and uh, the pandemic's numbers are going up. I think, fortunately, we don't have as many deaths as we had in the past, and we're more knowledgeable about how to deal with it. But nevertheless, numbers are increasing. In September, respondents reported their top three uh, emotions were frustration, worry, and anger. The number of responses choosing anger as one of the top emotions has more than doubled since March, rising from 20% to 45% in September. Negativity can have toxic effects. Her research has shown uh, over and over that we falter when exposed to negativity or rudeness. Witnessing rudeness interferes with our working memory and decreases our performance. So when we open ourselves up to this dialogue and we start being rude with one another, our productivity, our energy, everything suffers. Um, but she said the productive way to counter this is called thriving, the psychological state which people experience a sense of vitality and learning. Those people are growing, developing, and energized rather than feeling stagnated or depleted. Across a range of industries, Christine has found that people who experience a, spend, uh, a sense of thriving are healthier, more resilient, and more able to focus on the work. When people feel an, even an inkling of far thriving, it tends to buffer them from distractions, stress, and negativity. In the study of six organizations across six different industries, employees characterized as highly thriving demonstrated 1.2 times less burnout. compared with their peers. They're also 52% more confident in themselves and their ability to take control of a situation. That They were far less likely to have negativity drag them into distraction or self-doubt. So how do you increase thriving, right? Avoid negativity. Pay attention to what you're ingesting, right? You are what you eat. You are what you watch. You are what you listen to. You are who you talk to, right? <laughs> What information you choose to read, the media you consume, the music you listen to, the people you choose to spend time with, and the people you look up to. Negativity seeps into our pores through these channels. So make simple choices away from negativity and toward positivity. Watch out for what you say out loud. Be in control of your own emotions, folks. Negative language is particularly insidious and potent. Be mindful of what you're thinking. What's your self-talk like? And what are you saying out loud? Those around you are influenced by you and your mood. Uh, but we have more control over our thoughts and feelings than anyone else. That's what this show is about, the emotion roadmap. Take the wheel and control how you feel, what you think, what you say. What we say out loud carries significant weight. According to Trevor Moad, a mental conditioning coach who works with elite athletes, it's 10 times more damaging to our sense of thriving if we verbalize a thought than if we just think it. 10 times more damaging, that's a lot. So think twice about how you're framing and speaking about a situation. One of the things that I like to echo repeatedly over and over on my show is that you really want to be thoughtful about what you're about to say. How is it likely to make the other person feel? And is it how you want them to feel? One of the things about Braver Angels, which is a group I mentioned earlier, I, I suggested to you that you consider maybe attending some of their sessions. What they teach is not to change people's minds. They suggest that civil discourse is about helping you to understand why another person sees things the way they see them, thinks about things the way they think about them, feels passionate about certain things and why they feel the way they do. It's more about your understanding. And understanding leads to empathy. And empathy leads to more harmonious relationships, even when we disagree. We need to be able to disagree. Conflict generates our best ideas. We need to be able to manage conflict in a way that leads to higher levels of thinking, better outcomes, better choices, better ideas, more innovation. Conflict is great, but rudeness, a lack of willingness to consider another point of view, a sense of I have to be right and you're wrong, None of that's helpful. 
None of that's helpful. Yet you might believe it. I mean, I believe that my points of view and what I think and what I've learned have led me to a certain conclusions that I think are right. But am I 100% convinced that I've got it right? No, I'm not. I'm close. <laughs> I believe a lot of the things that I think are really well thought out and I've done a lot of homework. But is it possible there are things that I don't know that would change the way I view things? Absolutely. To be fair, absolutely. And I hope that you feel that way too, that you're willing to look at and consider what another person has to say, what another person feels, how another person thinks as different than you, and maybe a better version of understanding of what's transpiring than yours or not. But it's simply a willingness to explore and understand and to empathize with another person that creates a power that helps you to thrive, I believe. Another strategy that this author suggests is to adopt the neutral mindset. Negative thoughts and worries take us off track. We're more likely to struggle on basic tax, task. Long-term repetitive negative thinking is associated with cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease, actually, according to this. It also hurts others because they are then exposed to our negativity. Of course, it's all too easy to dwell on toxic people or situations. We might play the blame game, ruminate, or overanalyze the situation. It's far better to adopt a proactive mindset, focusing on what we can control and what we should do next. Neutral thinking, a non-judgmental, non-reactive way of assessing problems and analyzing crises. This includes staying in the moment, reacting to each moment as it unfolds, and keeping your focus on how you influence your next action. Don't get sucked into analyzing past failures or hijacked by future fears or thoughts. Take one play at a time. I'd like to say a little bit about non-judgmental thinking. It's so hard in our lives not to judge our own actions sometimes, certainly others' actions, or others' thoughts, or others' positions when they're different than ours. Now, I was trained many years ago when I became a therapist to view very, very sometimes horrific behavior and to not be judgmental. Because if I was judgmental, I couldn't enter that person's world in a way where I could somehow see what they were seeing and understand, at least at some basic level, why they might do such horrific things that they were capable of doing or that they've done. Because if you judge, it somehow clouds the way you're looking at the person and it impacts your ability to be helpful. That's what we're taught as therapists. Don't judge, be non-judgmental. Obviously, certain things are very hard not to judge. If you have a view, for instance, about abortion, um, it's so hard not to judge on one side or the other. A woman's right to control what happens to her body. An unborn child's right to life. I mean, <laughs> it's really hard to be non-judgmental about that. And I don't ask or suspect that people can be non-judgmental, but I do encourage you to at least consider that there is a side that makes sense to the person whose opinion and belief is different than yours. So one of the things that I think that needs to happen is another thing that we want to do to change our outlooks, the way we think, the way we process information, the way we respond to others, is to try and have an attitude of gratitude. <laughs> I like the rhyming version of that. Can you have an attitude of gratitude? Can you remember that? Sometimes that's something easy to remember. What are you grateful for? I think, you know, the fact that we all die, there's a sadness when one of us is gone, it's a loved one of others and we miss them d deeply. Um, but isn't it wonderful, on the other hand, that we're alive at all? That we have a chance to be with one another, to have experiences as families, as friends, as individuals, as competitors, as collaborators, where we have wonderful moments in our lives that we can enjoy. Isn't it great life itself has presented itself to us, that we are alive, that we have some moments in time where we can make a difference? And what do we do with that time? What do we do with that time? I'm hoping instead of attacking one another, 
because other people don't view things the way we view things, that we can somehow find ways to be supportive and loving and kind and grateful during our life's experiences. Can we all look to make a meaningful positive difference for one another? Because terrible times require strength and passion and caring and support and loving. And that's what we're being asked for, I think, at the, in these times, to understand why somebody disagrees with a lockdown, why somebody adamantly supports a lockdown, why somebody believes that one person is the right choice for our country and another person adamantly believes that the other person is the right choice for the country. What happens going forward? What are our commitments to ourselves? Can we have an attitude of gratitude? That's just another part of this I think that's really worth thinking about. Another way of thinking about this is to try and manage your energy. Um, a lot of what's happening today is exhausting, isn't it? I mean, part of what I deal with all the time is, you know, how much news do I watch? You know, how much do I read? Uh, how do I let go and just kind of go with the flow? Uh, I remember one of the things I was taught when I was younger and learning about a lot of different approaches to psychology was about gestalt psychology. Also about being in the moment, about being here now. One of the things that I ask people to do when they're trying to get more control of emotions, this is an interesting takeaway, by the way, in case the rest of what I'm talking about may not be meaningful to you, this hopefully is. The idea of trying to know more about how emotions impact you, there's a simple way that you can do that. That's very powerful, actually, and profound in some instances. If you're someone that's still working and you have a regular work day in front of you, um, this will work really well for you. For somebody that's retired, it's a little different, but it's still interesting to do. But let's say you're working and that you've got a job that somehow starts somewhere between 7 and 9 a.m. in the morning and then somewhere between 4.30 and 6.30 at night. And that you're home typically somewhere around 7.30. In the morning, at around 10 o'clock or 10.30, diary every day to ask yourself, how are you feeling? Are you feeling grateful? Do you feel like you're thriving? Are you feeling excited about the day still? Are you feeling energized? Are you feeling competent? Or are you feeling fearful? Or f are you feeling um, upset? Because maybe some of the things you thought you'd do in the morning, you got distracted and they're not gonna get done and that's clear now. As you're thinking about how you're feeling at 10.30, you're probably realizing that what you thought you were gonna do during the day, all of it isn't gonna happen because maybe something else came up more important, legitimately more important. Or maybe you went down a rabbit hole somewhere, you just got distracted by something that was interesting. In any case, around 10.30, you still got a little bit of time left to change how you feel. What would be more ideal to feel and how do you get there? What would make me more ideal, uh, a more ideal feeling for me is to feel satisfied that I got my priorities done. So I have to go back and think, okay, it's 10.30 now. I've got another hour and a half before lunch. Is there something I can do to make sure by lunchtime I'm feeling the way I want to feel? About 2.30, I realized that the day is almost gone. Three quarters of the day is pretty much gone now, 2.33 or so. And so I need to kind of think about what do I want to make sure is done by the end of the day so when I go home, I'm really able to go home. Because at the end of the day, at 7.30, when you're sitting at home, assuming you're home then, are you really present? Are you really present in the sense that you're there with personal time for you? Have you really let go of what's happening at your business, at your office, at your workplace, at your car repair shop? Have you really let go of any of that? Or are you still sort of there even though your body's at home? Are there people that you say you love and you love spending time with and they're in the house with you but you haven't really talked to them or really been with them even though you're in the house? So at 7.30, it's worth checking in before everybody starts to go into their bedtime routines, whatever that might be, and ask yourself, am I feeling the way I want to feel about being home right now? And if not, what do I need to do to feel differently, to feel more ideal? What, what, what do I want to feel and how do, I, how do I make that happen? Now, if you do that for a couple of weeks, three times a day, 10, 10.30, 2.33, 7, 7.30, 
I can promise you that you will learn some things about how feelings impact what happens to you, who you are, what you think about, and that it can have a profound impact if you let it. The thing that I teach on this radio show on the Emotion Roadmap, take the wheel and control how you feel, is to really understand that our feelings are really happening all the time. And while they're happening, we are thinking certain thoughts that are driven often by those same feelings. And those lead to certain behaviors. And the result of that is that we are not necessarily doing what's important to do. So when we stop and catch ourselves and don't let the feelings just sort of anonymously impact us, but we become proactive in identifying, what are we feeling? What's it making me think about? How am I behaving? If it's not helpful, any of it, stop and say, what do I want to feel instead? What would be ideal to feel at those three times during the day? And see if you can get there. And you will find life is better. You will find life is better. That's what the show's about. Emotion roadmap, take the wheel and control how you feel. So life gets better if you do this. So learn about your feelings. What's coming? We know what's coming. We know that COVID's going up, the number of cases. I hope and pray that we don't have more, you know, obviously we'll have some deaths, but I hope and pray that the death count stays really, really low. I mean, we die from something, right? We die from, we die from you know, just natural, natural, natural causes. We die from other diseases like heart disease or cancer or kidney failure. Or, well, I mean, all kinds of stuff can kill us. You know, an, an accident, um, you know, something in the street or in a, in a car or walking or whatever. Um, so there's lots of things that can kill us. COVID's another one of those things. So we're going to die from something. We want to be as careful as we can. We want to wear masks. We want to socially distance. We want to keep ourselves quarantined to a, whatever degree we, we can. At the same time, we know we got people who can't do some of the things that we think you're supposed to do. And because of their situations, they have to go to work. They have to be exposed. You know, again, they can wear masks and try to be distant, socially distant. But, you know, you walk into stores and people try to be socially distant, but I don't think it's happening as much as it could, right? Because we're, we're not perfect at these things. And yet, you know, the, what are the thoughts that we see when we somebody isn't social distant, right? I mean, that's part of the craziness going on in our own heads, right? We know people are trying. Maybe we think they should be trying harder because, well, a young person can be exposed and be asymptomatic. They can bring it home and somebody could die who's older. Everybody gets that, or at least you know, know that everybody gets that. But I think many people get that. And so we want to be more careful wherever we can. But it's also driving us kind of nutty, right? That's why I'm doing this show, is trying to give you some thoughts about how to be not so nutty. <laughs> right? All right. I got another act I'd like to read to you, too. This is more about, uh, well, this one. Yeah. This one is 10 ways leaders can improve engagement and well-being. While we are working, what are some things leaders can do? Because a lot of times people are removed, right? They're removed from the workplace. They're in remote locations. Let me give you an example of somebody I was talking to today. So a client of mine is talking to me. And he said that someone in the workplace who he really enjoys, who's um, a part of the team, and she's got a lot of the workload responsibility to support a lot of the leaders in the team, uh, who he likes, again, is somebody he really enjoys being with. He hasn't talked to in a while, and she was on a Zoom meeting with a group of people, all of whom she supports. She said, you know what? Honestly, folks, I'm kind of feeling disappointed no one has called to check in with me, except when they need something. I'm really missing the social interaction and the, the sharing of just small talk, how families are doing, ways to catch up with one another. And uh, I'm, honestly, I'm disappointed nobody's called. Now, he walked away from that feeling pretty terrible because he's somebody that she enjoys. He's funny, he said. You know, he like, likes to think of himself as funny. And <clears throat> excuse me. she's someone that um, is in the crowd with him at work where they often bump into each other <clears throat> and he shares a lot of um, you know good humored kinds of funny things that he might choose to say when he sees her and he likes seeing her and they joke around a lot and they talk a little bit about each other's families but he doesn't miss that when he's home that's not a need he has 
but it is an aid she has. Now, this isn't about gender, by the way. There are also extroverted men who also like the social interactions that they're missing at the workplace when they get together for coffee or, or for lunch or just some other reason that they happen to be in a meeting or even in a regular work meeting where they're not just talking about work. They're talking about a ball game they watch together or they're talking about somebody's son or daughter just did something that they're proud of and they're sharing it. Um, so I mean, there are people that really like that and some people that like that and don't need a lot of that. And then the people that actually don't like that are uncomfortable with it and are really happy to be at home. So what about reaching out to folks? What about trying to understand who's out there and what they might need from you? And I don't mean need from you in the way of work need, but social need. People want a sense of belonging. We learned that from Maslow a long time ago. People want to feel like they're part of a team and, and that team that people on the team care about one another. That's what makes the team feel like a team and not just a group of workers. Teams that really care about one another and demonstrate that somehow, that matters, that makes a difference. Understand? Hopefully that's clear to you because it isn't always clear. So one of the things I'd say to you is make sure that you feel that you're doing what you can, not just for yourself, but for others. Think about the people that are important to you. I don't mean just work-wise, just people that are important to you. And ask yourself, if you called them recently, if you picked up the phone, if you offered to have a Zoom meeting with them, if I know a lot of people are having Zoom meetings, one of the nicest things that's happened in my family that's helped us to thrive is, I don't remember which daughter initiated it. We have three daughters, they're all grown. None of them live in their home, they all have husbands. Uh, two of them have children. Two of them both have, uh, the two that have children both have two kids themselves. And um, our three daughters and my wife and I talk three, four times a week on a, you know, uh, you can use WhatsApp, you can use Facebook Messenger, uh, you know, free calls on our cell phones. And we can see each other, it's video chats and it's fun and it's nice. And it's not because we have to talk to each other, it's because we want to talk to each other and we care about each other and we want to know what's happening in each other's lives. And we're actually talking more now than we did before COVID. You know, COVID, you were going out a lot and you had less time to talk, but now we're, we're home a lot. Um, the other thing that I'd encourage people to think about and to do, it might be different than what you've done in the past, is really listen deeply to one another. I said that before. I said that about, you know, when you have disagreements with people who are, you know, have, are on the other side of the political aisle because, or, or they are de dealing with COVID differently than you see with, when you, what you think is the right way to deal with COVID or whatever, where you have disagreements. But it's not just about disagreements. I want you to think about listening deeply to the person that your partner's with, your spouse. Maybe you're not married, but you're living together. Whoever your partner is and whatever relationship you have, what about deeply listening to them in ways you haven't in a long time? What about really listening hard, not waiting for your turn to say what you're thinking about, but just making sure that during the day, a couple times a day, you really just sit down and let go of everything else that you're thinking about, that you're engaged with, that you're doing, and just really listen to the person you love and show them that you love them because listening is one way we do that. Really listening to one another at a very deep level. Just asking people, tell you more. Hmm, that's interesting. What else can you tell me about that? Wow, you sound like you feel really strongly about that. Hmm, is there anything that you need from me? Would you like some help? Would you like to tell me more about it? Is there anything else you want to say about it? Do you know how the other people are, are feeling that are involved, if it's involving others? I mean, asking open-ended questions, really engaging somebody, asking them to fully explore with you what's really in their mind. If you've ever had anyone listen to you that way, do you, you know how powerful and meaningful that can be. So when you're thinking about what you want to be grateful for, be grateful for the people that love you, that you love, that may be with you, that you may be tired of hearing their stories because you heard them before. You may know what the next sentence is that they're going to say, and you can finish their thoughts for them because you've been with them for so long. But allow them the chance to fully express themselves 
and to be really listened to and give that gift that you alone are capable of delivering. So with that, I'm gonna close and just say that I hope that you find the next few months, months of healing, months of listening deeply to others, months where you're not trying to explain why whatever you believe is the right way to believe. You're really looking much more to understand all those people around you, those who agree with you, because maybe you agree for different reasons. That's also interesting too. And also, it's just important to be grateful for what you have. And hopefully others are grateful for who you are. Thank you. Have a good week, and uh, I'll be back with you next week. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.